Welcome back to Questions for the Rector. I'm Stephen Heiner, and with us as always is the Rector of Most Holy Trinity Seminary here in Reading, Pennsylvania, His Excellency Bishop Donald Sanborn. Hello, Your Excellency. Hello, Stephen. So today we're going to be talking about something that, although chiefly concerns U.S. citizens who live under the U.S. Constitution, it's been so spoken about worldwide that even citizens of other countries may know about it, and that is our First Amendment. Yes. And I'm just going to read it briefly. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Sounds pretty nice. Oh, well, let's get into <laughs> that a little bit. <laughs> uh, first of all, a little background on that. The uh, South was uh, hesitant to um, to approve of the Constitution when it was drawn up. Uh, they felt that, or they feared that the North would uh, impose laws upon it that it didn't like. Uh, it it feared that they would have the same thing as they fought a war against, namely a, a King of England, so to speak, in Washington. Uh, so there was uh, there was pushback, as we say, fears that were not entirely unfounded, right? And so Patrick Henry said, "We're not going to." He was Virginia. He said, "We're not going to to approve the Constitution unless there are some assurances that these things will not happen." And one of the assurances that they needed was that the federal government would not interfere with the establishment of religion in states. Now, approximately half the states had established religions at the time, including Virginia, which was the Episcopal, the Anglican, you know. And uh, uh, so that's why that's in there. It really, uh, you see, the, originally the federal government was meant to be merely that, a government that would, uh, I mean, if you look at its powers in the Constitution, it it is to uh, regulate things that are interstate. It is to found a post office. It is to carry on a foreign policy and and the the military. Uh, you know, so the rest the states were were fairly independent, or you know, uh, you know they, they weren't just provinces of the federal government. Uh, and so. That's why that there was that fear that it would become an all-powerful federal government, which is exactly which is exactly what happened. Uh, uh, for, and, for more context, I suppose, you actually this was in reaction to the previous form of government. Many non-Americans might not realize this was America's third try. You had the monarchy, you had the Articles of Confederation, and yes. then you had this. And the Articles of Confederation didn't really have a unifying executive, and so this was trying to correct for this, but right. then. Maybe right. the correction went all the other way. Yes, and uh, Robert E. Lee said, if they win this war, meaning the Civil War, they will make the, the United States one big republic. And that is exactly what has happened. The states have become effectively powerless against the federal government. And that was with the help of um, uh, Roosevelt because he increased taxes a great deal and built up the, the treasury of the federal government and then if you wanted something for your state, you would go to the White House and ask for all of these funds. See, so he would therefore control really the whole country by this enormous return that you would get from all this big tax uh, collection that was going on. You see, so the federal government became just like a big fat cow that, that then would dole out to the states as they willed. And of course, you had to be of the right political persuasion, et cetera. Well, and I'm, so, I'm, I'm, so that's, that's just as a footnote to the whole thing. Well, I'm not because I think about a cow. You know, a cow provides real milk. But <laughs> yes. these days, there's you know, it'll have synthetic milk and fake milk and powdered milk because the yes. money's the money's fake. And well, that was the the famous story of the Tennessee Valley Authority. You see, that was a federally funded thing for the benefit of a state. And ordinarily, the states would take care of their own problems that way. You know, so it was that that idea of the federal government coming in with money, and then it controls you. And so you get used to that money, and then when you, know, you just have a disagreement with the federal government, they say, well, we're going to pull back our funds. And that's the way it works now. 
I suppose just as a, a footnote to your footnote, your or I'm, always, I'm reminded there is a story about Davy Crockett that there some house had burned down in D.C. and there was a widow involved and Congress had voted to give some funds to rebuild the house. And one of his constituents told him when he was back, he said, I'm not going to vote for you because you gave that money for that appropriation. And he said, well, you know, it was this poor widow. He says, it's not your money. Right. And right. that was back a time in America where people said, hey, if it's your money, you can, if it's your state's money, you can figure out what to do. But the federal government shouldn't have the ability. And of course, now we just live in a world in which that is the yes, case. Yes, the federal government, it was envisioned, uh, envisaged, I should say, by the founding fathers as something small and uh, which would really live off the, the states. In other words, the states uh, together, we, you know, would, uh, and I, they had a very limited power of taxation. They put the tax on whiskey <laughs> and there was the whiskey Re rebellion, rebellion. <laughs> in, in Western Pennsylvania uh, because they didn't like this federal tax. And uh, so, so the, the taxation ability of the federal government was very limited, excise taxes, you know, and luxury items and things like that. But this, uh, the federal income tax was, that was a whole other thing, you know, so. That so was, to take us back to your original context, the South hesitated to ratify. Patrick yes. Henry wanted these assurances and these assurances were sufficient? Yes, in other words, that, that the federal government would not interfere with the states on those issues. See, so it, it, I think it's a false accusation to say that the uh, federal government wanted to separate church and state. It just wanted to say, we won't touch your state situations, that's all. That, that was the sense of that, you see. So, uh, and that's the context of it. So it should not be interpreted beyond that, where we're going to separate church and state and we won't establish any religion. It's, it wasn't even in anyone's dreams that the federal government would, would tell Virginia you have to establish Judaism or something. It was not even in anybody's, or Catholicism. There was a lot of anti-Catholic feeling in Virginia mm. at that time. And and uh, so, uh, I mean, it, would, it was just outer space to think about that, you see. So that's why they wanted that assurance. Uh, so it was um, James Madison who did that uh, Bill of Rights in order to please the South, and the South came in, therefore, afterwards with those assurances. How how would a Catholic look at this word in your excellency, shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion? Is that in concord with the social reign of our Lord? Well, again, you have to think, in, in the context of, the, of 1789, with a, a tiny federal government and the states pretty much sovereign, I don't think you could object to that because it just wasn't the place of the federal government to be establishing religions. It was, it was not seen, it, it was the United States, you see, it wasn't America, or right? one big fat country, you see, it was the United States and the states were independent to the extent that they could make those laws for themselves. What I think is actually a worse problem is that the the attitude of the of the early let's say Americans was that there should be separation of church and state and all of the states eventually followed with that and that's actually worse there was that Jefferson said there should be a wall of separation between church and state the Constitution doesn't say that but there was an attitude in people's minds that you should not have a state religion that uh, a, a state religion is, is it just causes problems and things like that. And we are paying a very high price for that attitude of separation of church and state right now because the Congress and all of the lawmaking uh, functions in the United States has no moral compass. And you can see that with Roe versus Wade, that in 1973, I think it was, it's a it's a constitution. It's it's a right in the constitution that you can have an abortion, and then after sixty million babies have been slaughtered, well, it was a mistake. You see, we we're going back on it now, and that makes, I think, if you put Hitler, Mao Zedong, and Stalin together, you don't add up to sixty million necessarily. Maybe maybe you do, but sixty million innocent beings, babies slaughtered because some idiots, excuse me, in the Supreme Court thought that that was a constitutional right. 
And see, it has no moral compass. If there were, if if Christ the King were the the King of this country spiritually, that would never have even been considered. You see, but it has no moral compass. How do you make laws without a moral compass? You know, without without a a a set of commandments from God. How do you do that? You count on human beings to figure it out for themselves. The history of mankind is an absolute disgrace from that point of view. Hmm. But the founding fathers had this idea that you can have a society of reason, you see, and everyone will observe the natural law because reason will prevail in all cases. That's John Locke, and all of the founding fathers were infected with that. They're missing a little ingredient called original <laughs> sin, I Original suppose. sin and the darkness of the human intellect that will eventually sink just like a ship that has a big hole in it. And I'm sorry to say we are seeing that today. There is nothing against, for example, John Locke said, liberty is, consists in uh, doing whatever you want as long as you don't somehow injure the liberty of someone else. Well, then that gets into transgenderism. I mean, if the person next door is, you know, comes, out, comes home one day, he's a man, and comes out the next day, he's a woman. Uh, well, you know, well, that you know, doesn't bother me if he wants to be a woman, you see. That is contrary to nature. It's against the natural law. And, but you see, it doesn't bother me. You see, that, that's, and other things that don't bother me. You see, and so then you have this idea that, well, you can do pretty much whatever you want, especially in the world of, of sexual morality, because, well, you know, I have nothing to say to you. You have nothing to say to me. You see, so that, that is the disease that we have now. But what you've just articulated, Your Excellency, is a typical American attitude, mm -hmm. which could we not say traces back to this document and to those words that we started the episode with? That if there isn't an established religion, whatever well, that... Well, again, you're, you're saying that if, if the United States were in the... Then, in the same kind of, say, structure that it is in now, where you have an all-powerful federal government, Yes, so then I would agree with you. But in the context of the time, it was meant to be a tiny federal government. Don't forget, they had just revolted against a king in England who was imposing all of this stuff from far off. And they, they, the states were sovereign states that were put together you know, for certain things by the federal government. So you see this as a cuius regio, eius religio? Yes, yes, it, 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 uh, it's the federal government will not interfere with the states, and it's a state thing, not a federal thing. That's what the federal government is saying there, and that, you know, those, that First Amendment is saying this is not a federal thing, it's a state thing. And so one state could establish Catholicism, another one could establish the... But this is, as, as you've said, it's an imperfect situation as far as the church sees things. This is a compromise situation. It isn't something that the church would want. Normally, this church does not want separation of church and state. So, but again, go back to the state issue, not to the federal issue. Mm -hmm. In other words, the church has condemned separation of church and state. Uh, the the only thing that can be done with regard to false religions, non-Catholic religions, is to tolerate them if you have a serious reason, if there's some sufficient reason to do so. That is the position of the Catholic Church. Otherwise, the state must profess the true faith and, and uh, establish it as the, as the state religion. That's the Catholic Church's teaching. So I'm going to read from Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist Association, which has become so popular, as you note, that people think it's in the Constitution and it's worked its way into jurisprudence. Cases have been made or lost on this assertion. Gentlemen, the affectionate sentiments of esteem and approbation which you are so good as to express towards me on behalf of the Danbury Baptist Association give me the highest satisfaction. My duties dictate a faithful and zealous pursuit of the interests of my constituents, and in proportion as they are persuaded of my fidelity to those duties, the discharge of them becomes more and more pleasing. Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people, which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Adhering to this expression of the supreme will of the nation, 
in behalf of the rights of conscience, I shall see with sincere satisfaction the progress of those sentiments which tend to restore to man all his natural rights, convinced he has no natural right in opposition to his social duties. I reciprocate your kind prayers for the protection and blessing of the common father and creator of man, and tender you for yourselves and your religious association assurances of my high respect and esteem. Now, listeners, watchers, you might not know this, but that might be the longest period of time His Excellency has heard words from Jefferson and not gotten ill. No, I read a whole book about uh, Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, and I actually am a bit of a student of the American uh, Constitution and Declaration of Independence, that whole period. I, I read books about it. Uh, and uh, no, that doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, you have to understand that Jefferson was probably an atheist. He may have said that he's a, he was a deist. I mean, occasionally he talks about some sort of God, but pro most probably an atheist. As a matter of fact, he was considered an atheist by the Protestants when he suggested that there should be freedom of religion everywhere. That's, that's how much the Protestants objected to the idea of a, a state without religion. But, and he was totally in favor of the French Revolution. He was a radical. I don't think that in that sense he necessarily reflects all of the American idea at the time. Uh, he was, uh, he, you know, uh, a radical uh, and uh, rejoiced at the French Revolution. What does that say that he's a darling of American conservatives today, Your Excellency? Well, American conservatives, uh, I'm sorry, and I'll probably get in trouble for this, but they see America as a great country. Then the, the logic goes this way. Well, then everything that was happened at the Founding Fathers, the Declaration of Independence and, and the Constitution is wonderful and great because it made a great country. That's the logic. And no, it wasn't that way. The, the Founding Fathers were imbued with the 18th century deistic and rationalistic thinking. And uh, they were in most, well, many, many cases, deists. That means God exists, but he doesn't bother with us. He made the world, but, you know, he's off on his own now. I always say it's something like having your grandfather in Florida. You know, you send him a Christmas card once in a while. The, that, that is the notion of a deist. Jefferson was at least a deist, if not an atheist. Uh, Washington was a deist. You see, many others were deists. Uh, Madison. Many were Freemasons. That means they were naturalists and rationalists, and they saw religion as something that was that contributed to the general wisdom of Freemasonry. You know, you take a little bit here, a little bit there from this and that. That's typical of Freemasonry. Uh, Washington was a Grand Master, so uh, and they were heavily, heavily influenced by the philosophy of John Locke, who also was a Deist, uh, and all of that 18th century and 17th century English thinking that really brought on the French Revolution. The, the revolutionists in France learned everything. In, they went to school in England, essentially. Voltaire and all of the rest learned all of their hard thoughts from England, and they brought them back to France. And because France was the leading country of Europe at the time, France just blew up with it and spread it all over the place. You see? Uh, so. Uh, but it really had its source in England. So we'll just look at these sentences, Your Excellency, and if you could give a commentary. Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. No, that's, that's absolutely false. No, the, the, a, a nation without religion, the United States of America at least if you look at it from the point of view of its federal constitution, was the first country in the history of the world not to have an established religion. The first in the history of the world. See, so he's talking about something that is radical from the point of view of even the history of man. The Egyptians had their priests, the Greeks had their priests, the Romans had their priests. The, the, you know, all of the barbarians and all, they were all religious people and would not think of constituting a state without a religion. Because how do you, again, where's your moral compass? How do you make laws without a, a moral code? You see, 
it was the first country, first country in the history to have those ideas. And as I say, what is worse than the Constitution, or you know, I, mean, I think the Constitution can be absolved in its context. But what is worse is that attitude that Jefferson is is uh, uh, saying there, and which became a, a general American principle that you can do whatever you please, and religion is part of that as long as you don't bother me. So you disagree with this assertion that he's making that the quote he gives about establishment of religion, he says, thus building a wall of separation between church and state, yeah. that that sentence can be read without coming to that conclusion. No, no, that's condemned. Yeah, no, that, that, what he's saying is condemned doctrine. But he, he was, uh, I mean, he was one of the worst individuals in history. Really, he, he was a, a scoundrel. And, and as we know, he was immoral. He had slaves. You know, he, he was just a scoundrel. It's the only word, per, you know, and it's, if you study some of these founding fathers, you know, it's not, uh, not very edifying at times. Adhering to this expression of the supreme will of the nation in behalf of the rights of conscience, I shall see with sincere satisfaction the progress of those sentiments which tend to restore to man all his natural rights, convinced he has no natural right in opposition to his social duties. Well, again, he is making the Constitution, in my opinion, say more, to, making it say more than it says. The original idea of the Constitution is that it would not interfere with the states with regard to their establishment of religion. And many of the states, I think it was about half, already had established religions. So, but he's putting words in the mouth of the Constitution. The Constitution never said separation of church and state. But he, you know, he said separation of church, wall of separation of, between church and state. And in fact, there is not a wall of separation between church and state in this country. Uh, they say prayers at Congress. They get, you know, ministers in and even Catholic priests in to lead Congress in prayer. I mean, that's not separation of church and state. Uh, uh, church properties are tax exempt in this country. That's not true in any other country in Europe. They're not tax exempt. Maybe England, they're, they're, you can get well, tax exempt. Sometimes they're owned by the state because they were stolen. Yes, they were stolen by the state. So I wouldn't call that separation of church and state. No, the, the, there is, uh, the, the American government has always favored religion, you might say. Uh, but the problem is that it is more the attitude among Americans and among its leadership, but in Americans in general, that religion should not enter into politics. It should not enter into, into morality and you know, public uh, legal morality and so forth. It, it's your own private thing. So some of our watchers and listeners who are hearing these ideas for the first time, they might be asking, well, is His Excellency arguing for a theocracy? that the church and state should be joined together? Well, theocracy means that, that there is usually, it depends on how you define it, but it usually means that there is an excessive, you might say, union of church and state. The church, the church has its sphere and the, the, the state has its sphere. The church seeks the salvation of souls. The state seeks the general temporal happiness of its people. But because man is composed of body and soul, many times those things cross. And where they do cross, state and church must act together. And because the church is higher than the state and the soul is, is more important than the body, the state should, should submit to the, to the church's interests with regard to the salvation of souls. See, so it should... Uh, for example, in the Middle Ages, I mean, the church, the, the state was building those cathedrals and, and you know, th that didn't come necessarily out of the the coffers of the church. I mean, the... The priests the, were exempt from military service. Yeah, they were exempt from military service. Uh, there was uh, a general support of, of the church. So even to this day in Germany, priests are paid by the church, right. by the state, I'm sorry. This is still existing from medieval times and... and yes, in a way, you see, yes. I mean, it's, it's, there's a favoring of the church and a sort of uh cooperation but theocracy is is too strong no so there are a couple other things beyond this establishment claw establishment point in that 
First Amendment, no abridging of the freedom of speech or of the press. That's one side. The right of people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. I would suppose those two are not objectionable. They're not objectionable. Freedom of speech and freedom of the press, isn't that, aren't those great things, Your Excellency? Well, it depends on what you mean by it. There is a legitimate freedom of speech and a legitimate freedom of the press. But to express it that way, uh, I think is very imprudent because does that mean you can say whatever you want? Of course not. It has to be all within the moral law. So you can't blaspheme, for example. Uh, that would be against the moral law. Uh, freedom of the press, you can't print whatever you want. And based on freedom of the press, I remember that, that pornographic magazines were considered art and freedom of the press, etc. Uh, that was in the 1960s, I believe. Uh, many other things, uh, uh, various blasphemous things have been uh, uh, permitted as, as freedom of speech, etc. I mean, you're never allowed to do whatever you want. <laughs> there is a law, and the law dictates what you may do or may not do. So to say freedom of the press, freedom of speech without any reference to law, not even the natural law, I think is very, very imprudent for it to have been worded that way. And so we are down to present day and some people might look at these words and hear what you've had to say and, and they think about, let's say, members of their family who've joined the military, who've served in, in government and they've had to raise their right hand and say that they're going to support and defend the Constitution, but you've noted in today's conversation just briefly some of the problems with that. Is it a problem for a Catholic to to take an oath to support and defend this Constitution? Not if you understand them correctly. I mean, if you say there's a due freedom of speech and a due freedom of the press, you know, the, the Church would have no objection to that, and that the federal government will not establish religions in the various states. You could say that because of the nature of the federal government. In Switzerland, for example, you have state religions or cantonal religions established, in, and there's the Protestant religions, uh, Protestant cantons, and the and the Catholic cantons. You see, then in Bern you have a federal government, but those cantons are actually more independent than even the states are here. Well, the Swiss have been guarding those rights for many centuries. Yeah. Your Excellency. You know, so, uh, so th there's there's establishment there. You see, and and that, that's the idea is that the federal government will not touch the state's uh, personal, or uh, let's say you know, there's what pertains to the states. Uh, for example, the federal government does not make murder illegal. That's a state thing. You see, you are prosecuted, prosecuted by the state if you murder somebody. You don't go before a federal judge for that. You go before a state judge. Uh, that's what I mean by that, that there are certain uh, laws and, and, you know, that, that pertain to the states only. Uh, and not to the federal government. As I said, the federal government, if you read its powers, I couldn't find anywhere, for example, in reading the Constitution where it says that the Supreme Court has the right to interpret the Constitution or to interpret the laws of the nation. I couldn't find it. If somebody could find well, it... Well, John Marshall found it. Let, let, me, <laughs> let me know, but normally the lawmaker interprets the law. So it really should be the Congress that has some sort of commission or something like that uh, for interpretation of law, mm. not some unelected beyond the ballot box, uh, well, you know, individuals, let's say, uh, that, you know, are, are have their, you know, nine people, nine, is it nine people? Yeah. Uh, and where it's supreme, I mean, you can't, they're untouchable. You know, that, and, and they say, this is what the law means. The, the interpretation, interpretation is to discover what some, the, the true meaning of what someone said, what he had in mind to say. That's interpretation. It's not spin. It's not, well, we'll make, make him say this, or this is what we think he should have said, or... Or there's see, a right to privacy yeah, here. You know, yeah, you know, does that, that word exist in the Constitution? I don't think so. Right to privacy? I don't think it's in the Bill of Rights. You know, the, the, and to interpret it in that way, I mean, can you murder your mother-in-law and put her in the closet and say, I have a right to privacy? <laughs> right to privacy. <laughs> that can mean anything. You know, I, I mean, it, it's, it, it's something totally out of control. And again, the founding fathers listened to John Locke and uh, Montesquieu about the division of powers. And according to Catholic 
of political philosophy that makes no sense whatsoever. So I'm anticipating the comment section from some people who've, who've never run into you before and say, well, this, you know, leftist bishop, we should deport him. You America, love it or leave it. So what would you say to Catholics who are watching this and feel a bit uncomfortable about some of the things that you've said? Because as you say, American conservatives have a tendency to see America as you know basically God's nation. God created yes. it yeah. and it's the greatest country ever. Um, how would you give them greater context, not only to understand what you said, but maybe to do some reading and research on their own? Well, first of all, you should be patriotic about your country, no matter what its faults should be. That's, first of all, it's actually part of justice, the virtue of justice to be patriotic. So every country in the world has some faults in it. Uh, but I think they should, on, on the other hand, realize that the, the founders were not Catholics. As very, they were badly influenced by rationalistic philosophies of the 18th century, and they have created for us exactly what we have today, that we have no control. There's not even the observance of natural law, and we can't do anything about it. And the, the president has become virtually a dictator. He just approved today 1.2 billion dollars in forgiveness of of loans the student loans that means he's giving away taxpayer money without any consent of congress and any, any lawmaker giving it away you're okay it's be like if banks said to everybody you don't have to pay your mortgages anymore i mean th we're in a dictatorial situation and the the whole system of checks and balances has broken down it doesn't work why doesn't the congress revolt at that you know, and and but and then the two-party system is also an absolute disgrace. That that the that, that there's these these monoliths, these two monoliths that that, uh, you know, either one or the other. Uh, George Washington absolutely abhorred the idea of parties, political parties. He saw it again. You know, where nice gentlemen who didn't need the money would be elected. They would go to Congress for a month or something, pass a few laws, and then go home to their farms. You know, these, these you know, upstanding gentlemen. That was the idea. I mean, these people were living in a different world from ours, and I think they un should, the American today should understand it. And if they're seeing the morality sinking in this country and this country becoming a socialistic country, it's because of the problem of the founding fathers. I think uh, that's always the problem here to see when people say, we just have to go back to the founders. We have to go back to the original intent. This We're here because of the original intent of there, the founders. There is no moral compass. And the, the, uh, the uh, federal government has become a monster. And it has uh, replaced, I mean, if the, if the early colonists came back and saw this, they would say, well, why did we split from England? <laughs> Very famously, we uh, someone has said that we were never so lightly taxed as under the king. Right, right, and uh, but that's a whole other thing. I just was listening to a book about that taxation without representation, but the the, uh, uh, the it was very light taxes. But the but that's a whole other show. Is is that whole thing about that? So where, where should Catholics go to better understand? You referred to Catholic political philosophy. Are there encyclicals that they should look to? And then what what might be? I know you're a student of U.S. history. What might be a couple books that they might go to to understand what? Uh, oh, real I, off US the history? top of my head, uh, I, I couldn't. Uh, but there are a lot of books written about the colonial period and the motives for the uh, Revolutionary War. Uh, I'm in the middle of one right now, and uh, I just can't remember the name of it because <laughs> I listened to it in my car. Uh, and and uh, they should study the period more. They should not just canonize it because America is great. What has made America great is the fact that the average person was decent. He obeyed at least the natural law. He obeyed common sense. People had common sense. They worked hard. The, the government stayed out of your, your working situation. It was before socialistic uh, laws came in. We just had, for example, the Remington Arms. They moved to Georgia because New York State became so overburdened with all kinds of regulations that they had to quit. They were there for 200 years in a place called Ilion, New York. Mm. I mean, that's an example. The, the country is gradually becoming socialistic. 
uh, the the uh, uh, so they have to understand what are the sources of that. Now, something went deeply wrong, and the checks and balances and all of the things that this 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 perfect country that was envisioned by all of these founding fathers really it was a fantasy. Is a fantasy and thing. You know, there was something wrong with the founding. That's what I'm saying. And but that's what makes America great is its people. But the people are starting to decline now. And that's why you're seeing a divided America between people who have common sense and people who are totally debauched and sick in their minds. Well, on that optimistic note, <laughs> <laughs> but I do think you make a, a, good, a good point, Your Excellency, that people, if they want to know more, they can't just rely on the mainstream media. They need to go back and read yes. and study the period and, and learn and, and realize, as you say, it's a virtue to be patriotic about your country, but it doesn't mean that you can't notice the faults when they're right in front of your face. Yes, that's correct. Starting with the First Amendment. Yes. Well, as always, listeners, if you if you have friends who would be interested in this topic, please share this with them. Like, you can subscribe to the channel to get other videos like this. If you enjoyed what his Excellency had to say, feel free to leave a super thanks or go to the donate page, which is listed in the description, and you'll be able to support the formation of clergy who are properly taught about uh, how to understand uh, church and state and their relation to the government. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency.